Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And today I'll be moderating a discussion um, on the constitutional structures and governance of the United Kingdom. And we're very lucky to have two um, experienced and authoritative speakers today. First, Professor Jim Gallagher from the universities of Glasgow and St. Andrews. Uh, he was a for is a former senior civil servant in the Ministry of Justice, concerned particularly with devolution issues. And during the, the referendum, the Scottish referendum, he was a, a prominent spokesman and advocate on, on the unionist side. Our other speaker is Glyndora Jones, uh, who's a member of the Institute of Welsh Affairs. And in recent years, he's been a, a, a prolific commentator on constitutional and governance issues within the United Kingdom. In particular, he's interested in the differences and similarities between federalism and confederalism. So welcome to you both. Um, I think we'll begin with Gundur, if that's all right. Um, very naive question to kick off with. Um, how do you think the de devolved arrangements of the United Kingdom have been working over the past couple of years? Well, look, thanks, Brendan, and thanks for inviting uh, us onto your podcast. Uh, now, if I look at the current circumstances, each nation has in recent decades developed an individual political culture with clear distinguishing features from their neighbours. In Northern Ireland, a bespoke system of checks and balances derived from the Good Friday Agreement is in place, while success has been intermittent in terms of Stormont's operation, any differences have been pursued in the political arena. And yes, the UK government's recent position on the protocol has put this equilibrium at some risk but resolution hopefully now seems to be on the horizon. In Scotland, the growth of the SNP from a level where it achieved less support proportionally in 1999 than Plaid Cymru in Wales, has seen Scottish independence dominate the UK constitutional debate. A second referendum is demanded for the near term. Of course, how vigorously depends on Nicola Sturgeon's successor, but the issue is likely to continue to pose a challenge to any future Prime Minister in London. And in Wales, well, partly due to the shortcomings of the original devolution settlement, there remains reluctance on Westminster's part for the nation to obtain some of the powers taken for granted in Northern Ireland and Scotland, including control of the police and the judicial system. The focus has been on a gradual accretion of extra responsibilities over the past quarter of a century through four separate Wales Acts, but the ongoing commission on the constitutional future of Wales is looking at this. And yet, and this is an important yet, England comprises over 56 million people, more than five times the total of all other UK nations combined. And it still lacks the national institution framework through which its internal inequities may be addressed. You know, in terms of wealth, status, power and population, it is, of, it is orientated heavily towards the South producing almost 22% of the UK total output, London acts as a strong centripetal force, undermining the position of other English regions generally. So for me, there's now a compelling case, if not a need for change and reform. Jim, uh, do you have a similar view of the, uh, differentiated view of the, the institutions in particular of the evolved United Kingdom? Well, I think there is certainly a degree of difference between the uh, the different institutions. Uh, Northern Ireland is very different for uh, reasons that we could discuss if we're, if we're interested. But uh, I think that the assessment of how, as it were, devolution is doing requires us to think really about three things. First, the extent to which um, it is able to reflect the separate political identities of the different nations. And when in operation, I think it's fair to say that devolution has been quite successful in doing that. Uh, people in Wales have gradually come to support devolution in a way which they didn't uh, uh, at its instigation. Uh, people in Scotland have always supported it and remain uh, more supportive of it than, than, of, uh, than of other forms of government. Uh, and in both Scotland and Wales, uh, the devolved institutions are unsurprisingly uh, more trusted than the uh, UK government, as, as one would hope they would be, as they only have Scotland and Wales to look after. Uh, so in that sense, the first sense, which is, uh, I guess, what Glyndor was saying, uh, yes, devolution has been a success. The second question about devolution is, has it done what it said it would do uh, in terms of improving the lives 
of the populations of Wales and Scotland and indeed uh, Northern Ireland. Has it been a policy success? Are the children better educated? Are the hospitals better run? Uh, mm -hmm. Are the houses warmer? And so on. Um, and then I think uh, the, the jury is still out. And 20 years after the evolution, it's quite hard to point to a long list of big policy successes, either uh, in Scotland uh, or in Wales. And if I confine myself to Scotland, I think we have seen, um, in many respects, a relative decline in the success of Scotland's public policy, for example, uh, in relation to the economy, uh, in relation to education, or in relation to health, which are obviously very much at the top of the uh, uh, people's priorities, if you ask them. And the third dimension that one needs to think about devolution through is, how does it work in the UK as a whole? How are the relationships between the devolved and the central government? Uh, how are, are the ways in which they work together or don't work together? Uh, how do the institutional structures of devolution deal with issues which cut across uh, the competence boundaries, as many, many issues do? And here, I'm afraid, uh, we haven't done very well. And there are a variety of reasons for that. The institutional structure of devolved cooperation uh, has been at best stuttering and sometimes really quite difficult. A fair amount uh, is done, as it were, behind the scenes by officials, uh, and some of that works tolerably well. But unfortunately, we've been blessed uh, with a series of governments, either in uh, Edinburgh or in London, who are obsessed by asserting sovereignty and power, and that makes for bad relationships between them. So the relationship side of the equation is one which needs significant repair. Very interesting contrast between the, the, the two um, analyses. But but uh, let's go back to the question of England. Uh, we can talk fairly coherently and uh, um, understandably about um, devolution structures for Northern Ireland, for Scotland and uh, and Wales. Much more difficult to have any overall picture for, for England. Um, do you think, um, Glyndor, that that is a, a particular barrier to a rational and coherent discussion about um, the UK and its governmental structures? To which um, uh, Jim Callagher was Callagher was referring in, in at the end of his first set of remarks. Yes, Brendan. Yes, uh, you know, England endures as the uh, most highly centralised country in Europe. The limited powers assigned to the mayors and combined local authorities do not compensate for the uh, centralist culture of Whitehall and Westminster, as John Denham highlights in his recent report, English Democracy. 20 years after English domestic policy on health, education, transport, social care, agriculture, and many other issues were separated from the devolved nations, these policies remain the responsibility of the UK government. You know, England has neither a senior minister, nor a committee of ministers, nor a committee of civil servants for that matter, that is responsible for coordinating English national policy. And this has resulted in the UK government comprising of many ministers whose responsibilities rest almost exclusively within England. And yet the cabinet itself lacks a clear focus on England as a territory. The situation, if you take it a few steps further, is compounded by the role of the UK Prime Minister, who uh, doubles as the English First Minister, I would suggest. You know, this introduces some conflicts of interest into decision-making, as illustrated, for example, by the uh, impact of the post-Brexit UK Internal Market Act on the devolution arrangements. The extent of unease between the institutions, for instance, in Cardiff and London, has increased to such that the Government of Wales devolved powers bill is presently going through the House of Lords to ensure that powers devolved to the Senate cannot be amended or withdrawn by the UK government in the future without a supermajority vote in Cardiff. So for me, you know, intergovernmental relations across the UK need to be redefined on a stronger formal footing and codified in a new constitutional framework. Jim, do you, do you agree that the, the role of England, um, both objectively and, if you like, uh, institutionally, um, makes a particular set of difficulties for a, a, a coherent and, um, and, and symmetrical um, set of constitutional arrangements for the United Kingdom? 
Yes, that's obviously true. England is 85% of the total of the UK. And any arrangement which has to work with 85% of the UK in one unit and 15% in three others is obviously going to be asymmetrical and is going to be at best untidy. Um, I think there are, however, some errors to be avoided here. Uh, and I've recently been working uh, with the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown on the reform of the UK constitution and we've uh, we have some very detailed proposals uh, for how this should be addressed and in particular how devolution in England should be pursued. Uh, people talk about the English question. There are two English questions. At least, at least. At least indeed, that's right. Um, happily, there is now at least one English answer. Uh, the two English questions that definitely exist are one, what about England as a whole? How does England as a polity uh, uh, express itself? How does it operate? How are its views uh, implemented or taken into account in policy making? And the second uh, uh, is, of course, that England, as Glendor rightly says, uh, is the most centralised state, uh, as far as I can see, in the known universe. Uh, no large country has the agglomeration of power at the centre that the UK has, and the UK has it because it has it for England. And uh, my analysis of that, which is uh, shared by the Brown Commission, um, oh. is that that hyper-centralisation is closely linked to another point Lundur made, and that is the imbalance of the UK economy across its territory. The UK is the most unequal large country in the OECD in geographical terms. Uh, we have uh, an arrangement in which almost all uh, the wealthy bits of the UK are concentrated in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, and the remainder of the UK is almost uniformly underdeveloped by comparison. And this is linked causally uh, to the hyper-centralisation of the UK. So English decentralisation uh, is a necessary condition, uh, in my view, uh, to deal with the economic imbalance of the country. And it's also a necessary condition to have sensible intergovernmental relations across the whole territory. Because the structural problem which the UK government faces is that for 85% of the country, it thinks it's a micromanager that must take every single decision. Bad news, it's not good at taking local decisions. And when it's failing to take them well, it's also failing to do its own national strategic job well. But it still tries. And as it tries to do that, it finds it very difficult to take a hands-off approach to the 15% of the country where there is actual decentralization. And this is at the root of the UK's dysfunctional intergovernmental arrangements. If I just to finish the argument here, um, I think, however, one should be careful about thinking that, well, the answer uh, is a kind of Napoleonic imposition on England uh, of a regional structure and regional assemblies or regional legislatures. We know that England doesn't want uh, regional legislatures. It doesn't want a parliament in Plymouth. It wants executive devolution all across the country. But if England believes, and I think it's right to believe, that its parliament is Westminster and should stay that way. And in the Commission on the Future of the UK, which Mr Brown chaired and which the Labour Party has now accepted, uh, we propose a very substantial executive devolution across England in uh, various ways which I can explain if uh, colleagues are interested, uh, combined with new intergovernmental structures, a council of the nations and regions in which the devolved and the English decentralised bodies uh, are able to work together with the UK government. So that's a long answer to a short question, but I think it is undoubtedly the way forward. Yeah, so that there are no uh, indecent questions, there are only indecent answers. So, so thank you for the long answer to a short question. But, but I think I will take up um, something from Jim uh, there uh, before coming back to Gundur. Um It sounds to me, from what you're saying, uh, as if the, the general philosophical concept of a, of a federal 
United Kingdom, is one to which you wouldn't be particularly sympathetic. Am, am I misreading your thinking on that? I think you are, rather. Um, yes. What I do not see uh, uh, as obvious for the UK it, it is a naive federalism uh, in which there are four units, one of which is more than 10 times bigger uh, than any of the others. Uh, and uh, if one thinks of federalism simply as um, four countries and the Senate consists, as it were, of an Englishman, an Irishman, a Scotsman and a Welshman, you know, one only has to see that, that that's pretty silly. But I would, um, uh, I would think that the underlying principles of federalism uh, matter deeply here. And the uh, two of the underlying principles that I would um, uh, draw attention to, I think, in this context are first, that power is divided between different levels of government in a way which is not easy to change, as so we're constitutionally fixed in some way. And second, that each level of government has something that belongs to it alone, uh, which cannot be taken away from it except by constitutional change. Uh, and our challenge uh, in the UK is to find a way of entrenching this distribution of power in the uh, geographical sense against the doctrine of the sovereignty of parliament. Uh, and there are recommendations in the Brown Commission report uh, to deal with that. But those principles, that the underlying idea of federalism, which is distributed power, closer to the people it serves, dealing with the things that can be best dealt with at that level. The principle of subsidiarity, of course, and it says precisely that, seems to me that to be quite pertinent to the UK, despite the asymmetry between uh, the different nations. So, uh, just one question there before we come to Glyndor, if, if I may, because I think it will clarify the, the argument. Uh, people who are aware from a federalist point of view of the difficulties that you've pointed to, um, sometimes advocate um, eight or nine or 10 uh, regional governments for the United Kingdom. Um, it seemed to me you were suspicious uh, of, of that proposal. And that was why uh, I wrongly attributed to you some suspicion about the general principles of, of federalism. Can you unpack that a little bit? Please? Yes, I think that, that that's, that's an important question and a very good question. Um, what we learnt um, in um, the devolution arguments for Scotland and the devolution arguments for Wales is that what matters to people is the ability to express their identity in political structures. There has to be a match uh, between how I feel about myself and those who represent me. So uh, Welsh people increasingly feel comfortable with the idea of being represented by Senator in Cardiff Scottish people have consistently felt very comfortable about being represented by a parliament in Edinburgh because it expresses, in each case, a national identity and an identity which has given a political substance uh, through the uh, devolution settlements. England is different. Uh, first, it doesn't naturally fit into regions. And the one attempt we made to do that, which was in 2001, uh, uh, fell flat in its face. Um, uh, after the uh, referendum uh, in, I've forgotten the year, uh, in the Northeast. We tried to impose a Napoleonic federal structure on the Northeast, which looked like the best customer, uh, uh, and, uh, and the folk didn't want it. Instead, uh, what we should do, in my view, is to build up from the existing substructures, ask ourselves at what level various different functions, what geographical level, what scale, various different functions are discharged and create executive aid, um, bodies, executive coalitions, if need be, of different local authorities and others uh, to deal with those tasks with appropriate regional or city regional governance across them. It will be untidy uh, because England is untidy. If the geography of England was perfect and it fell into three or five or eight uh, pre-existing regions, this problem would not be for, uh, in front of us. But it doesn't, and we have to go with the flow of what the people of England want. We can't give them something from above. They won't like it, and they would be right not to. No, I've um, dwelt on Jim's views, um, but I'm going to give you um, a good opportunity now to come back in. Um, I mentioned the, the word federalism. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you freely associate in your own mind with federalism, whether, whether it's something that you think 
either in principle or in practicality is, is applicable to the United Kingdom and make for better s- structures and governance in the United Kingdom? Uh, my view is that a traditional federal model is uh, is problematic. Uh, you have to protect the UK's unity post-Brexit, the Welsh government it has suggested federalism as a way forward, mirroring some, you know, some views in Scotland. However, federalism was delivering more powers to Wales does offer restricted opportunities for expanding Scottish autonomy beyond the status quo. Now, the federalism would would likely deliver a form of the ballot formula as, as designed by the Welsh government, but would impact negatively on the Scottish bloc grant, strengthening the attraction of a second independence referendum. So I think the constitutional debate has moved on substantively in recent years. I mean, when we talk about our traditional federal model, the fact that England comprises 85% of the UK population clearly uh, um, poses challenges of a serious structural nature. Your views in Wales about the nature of Cardiff's interaction with Westminster is evolving, especially due to the impact of Brexit. And the mood in Scotland, and I'm sure Jim is far better placed than I to comment on this, has hardened. My view regarding the SNP's present platform of pursuing an independent Scotland within the European Union is that it is a problematic proposition. It restricts the nation's ability to facilitate a single market with its largest trading partner, England. And we only have to think of the situation in Northern Ireland to understand the uh, complexities presented by this scenario. So, you know, given that, to go back to the traditional model, as Jim uh, has uh, outlined, of a federal UK is politically difficult, uh, in my view, and that secessionist tendencies are, you know, are are, are prevalent uh, in some in some of our nations. There is a need to explore some sort of broad constitutional compromise, which uh, strategically embraces the concerns of both unionists and nationalists and moves away from a when it takes all answer to the challenges ahead. We need to pose the questions. We need to get ourselves to a space where we talk usefully. Um, uh, uh, as as neighbouring countries about what kinds of functions do we want to share? You know, what kinds of aspirations do we hold for our children, for our children's children in the future? And how can we best support uh, those ambitions and those aspirations through uh, uh, developing a model of working, a uh, model of collaboration, which, uh, which allows most people to get, or many people to get most of what they want, but not uh, clearly not everybody can get everything that they want. We need to frame the conversation possibly in, in a different way to which we have we have so far. You're interested uh, in contradistinction to federalism uh, in models of confederalism. Can you say a bit more about what that would involve in, in detail and, and why you favour it, as I understand it, uh, over even even sophisticated federal models? Thanks. Um, yeah, devolution uh, involves a sovereign Westminster delegating a measure of sovereign authority to the devolved institutions, put simply. Confederalism, or its more collaborative manifestation, which I often discuss, confederal federalism, turns this approach on its head, advocating four sovereign nations of radically different population sizes, delegating some sovereign authority to central bodies in agreed areas of common interest. In the model that I've outlined as a proposal, a Council of the Isles could be responsible for enacting powers on defence, diplomacy, internal trade, currency and macroeconomics, with a committee of member nations convening regularly to discuss issues which may demand a degree of cooperation and harmonisation of laws. The head of the Confederation could continue to be the British monarch, holding frequent audiences with the First Ministers and thus balancing change with continuity. The national parliament of each member nation would sit as the legislative representative body of its people and having every power and right not delegated to the joint institutions already described. And these national legislatures would be mirrored by legal structures. And Wales itself now has a strong case for introducing a distinct jurisdiction in in the nation. The ultimate authority on all laws and rights assigned to the centre could sit with the Supreme Court of the Isles. And, you know, uh, you know, put in summary, the model assumes a common currency, bank and market 
a guarantee of individuals' rights, residence and employment across all nations, with an agreed threshold level of welfare support in place, thus supporting our social, cultural union. I think they're holding our joint security. I feel this is important. The forces of defence and organisation of foreign policy uh, would be centrally held. Yeah. Uh, can, can, I, does, can you uh, finish that? And then I'll ask Jim to comment on that model, if I may. You know, this model does neatly deal with the sovereignty aspirations of the home nations and the real need to share some key functions on a line-wide basis. And it also allows for, uh, shall we say, a more imaginative approach for governance within England itself. Uh, but confederalism possibly uh, is a neater solution to deal with the imbalance in population sizes between, uh, between England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Jim, thank you. Thank you. Lindua, would you like to comment on that model? Yes, I, I would. I, mean, I, I rather like the word confederalism uh, and the underlying um, uh, key idea uh, that the United Kingdom is a union of nations which have come together. One can, you know, we can split, but most countries in the world are federal these days, as you well know, uh, and we can split them into roughly two kinds. So those where federalism has been a disaggregation of a, of a larger unit. Brazil would be an example of that. Uh, and those many other countries where federalism is a joining together, a coming together of previously separate units, the USA being an obvious example of that. Um, the UK is more like that, the latter, than the former. Um, uh, the UK uh, is a coming together, particularly uh, the Scottish story, uh, our story is a... Uh, was an involuntary coming together, but it was nevertheless uh, a, a coming together. Uh, Northern Ireland once again is a, in a uh, is in a place of its own. So the underlying notion that the United Kingdom um, is a place where people have confederated, where countries have come together to share what needs to be shared, but to retain uh, at home, as it were, those things which can best be managed at that level, seems to me to be right. Uh, secondly. Um, uh, an implication of that is that ultimately, uh, if, a, uh, if one of the constituent nations wants to leave, well, actually it can. Um, and this is obviously a particular issue in Scotland at the moment, though uh, my personal expectation is that um, that's about to go rather off the boil. Um, this story is again rather a different one. Uh, but nevertheless, no one, uh, and just the Scottish case, Scotland, if you really, really want to leave, we're going to force you to stay. So in that sense, uh, that confederation element uh, it is, it is important. Uh, the question is then how you construct the shared space, the things that go together. Um, then I don't quite um, uh, uh, agree with Kundur's uh, way of doing it, but the principle is the same, and that is, how do we manage the things that are best managed for all of us? And those things which do not need to be managed for all of us should manifestly be decentralized. Uh, uh, and this is the principle of solidarity that I mentioned before. Um, if I can refer again uh, to the uh, what I'll call the Brown Commission for shorthand, which uh, uh, Keir Starmer has adopted as Labour's plan uh, for the Constitution, it's not unlike this. It begins from saying that there must be an understanding of what the UK central state does uh, for its constituent nations and for its people. Some of that's economic. Uh, some of it is, as Glendower says, related to rights. Some of it is related to foreign affairs and defence. But that which doesn't have to be decentralised uh, decentralized, uh, must uh, naturally fall uh, to, the, um, uh, to the constituent nations or indeed within them to a, to a local uh, or indeed neighbourhood level in some in some cases. So the general idea, I think, uh, uh, Glendur and I are, are not far apart, or even if the uh, mechanics and the detail uh, would be rather different. What's proposed uh, uh, by Labour is, of course, a reform in particular of the House of Lords uh, to make it into uh, an assembly of the nations and regions, so a regionally based assembly, largely or wholly elected uh, nation by nation uh, and region by region, with particular powers uh, to look after 
the constitutional allocation of power inside the United Kingdom and to ensure especially uh, that the devolution of power, the decentralisation of power to the constituent nations is reflected by the UK government. Because one of the things that we have seen uh, over the last few years is a central UK government, which has been centralising on everything, but in particular has centralised power and taken it away, at least in principle, in an undesirable way, uh, from the devolved administrations. And there was no constitutional barrier to that. And what has been recommended by uh, the Labour Commission, as I say, adopted by Starmer, is that the, a reformed House of Lords should be able to do precisely that. I'll come back, if I may, to the difference between federalism and confederalism in conclusion. But um, does uh, the Brown Commission and, and events more recently in the evolution of the United Kingdom, do they do they make the case for a written constitution? Um, oh, and particularly in the context of the sovereignty of parliament, which has come up in, in several uh, responses to my questions. Um, Glinda, would you say something about a, a written constitution before we ask Jim to do that? Yes. Well, the UK is becoming increasingly diverse culturally, ethnically, legally, and politically. And a widely accepted approach to successfully embracing such variations is to revise the nature of governance. And in today's world, nearly 200 states are underpinned by written constitutions. And surprisingly, the UK is not. Establishing a new written framework for these isles, with the support of the four parliaments, could prove invaluable across the political spectrum, with some finding reassurances in uh, articulating a more distinctive elements of UK practices in the Constitution or Treaty, and with others seeking to cement the sovereignty position of the four nations individually in relation to a common British structure. Interestingly, Westminster's tacit acceptance of Scottish independence as a legitimate option for the 2014 referendum did suggest that sovereignty is ultimately determined by the populations of the nation separately and not by the people of a UK collectively a challenge to both Conservative and Labour parties is to become more formally representative of the nations within their organisational structures. The makeup of the Liberal Democrats is already federalised and the strength of the various nationalist parties at a level uncommonly seen in other multinational states globally. But Britishness as a concept, as I've said before, is much older than the UK. And it's unrealistic to argue that the Scottish or Welsh people, for that matter, say in notional independent territories, would start to consider the English as fellow Europeans rather than fellow British. So the challenge is to capture our shared British ideals, values, which in turn are shaped by common historic, cultural and geographic influences in a new framework, which strengthens arrangements for self-government was working within the, an isle-wide framework that is typified by pluralism, tolerance, justice, equality and solidarity. So we must approach our deliberations in the spirit of consensus building and cooperation, emphasising constitutional collaboration, I'd say, and not separatism. Jim, would you like to comment on the, the general prospect of... Uh of a, a, a written constitution, how that would link in with traditional ideas of parliamentary sovereignty, uh, and perhaps um, how sympathetic such an idea might be to, might have been, because I, I don't think that the, uh, it was recommended, was it, by the Brown Commission, uh, yeah. a, a written yeah. constitution? It wasn't recommended by the Brown Commission, uh, and for reasons which I'll explain. Um, of course, when we say Britain doesn't have a written constitution, Lots of it is written down. In fact, all of it's written down somewhere, uh, although some of it's written down in some very odd places. But, but it can be it. changed, but it can be changed more easily than typically written constitutions. That's precisely it. That's precisely the issue. Uh, the constitutional change in Britain is done uh, by the same process as the change in ordinary laws. Uh, and um, if, if you read your famous constitutional theorist, Dicey, he was great, advocate of parliamentary sovereignty, he rejoiced in this. Uh, he said that this was very important and it demonstrated how much better the British constitution was than other constitutions because it was flexible. And of course, uh, the 
great wisdom and the um, propriety of the British political class would ensure that nothing undesirable was done, that there were unwritten norms, that there were constitutional conventions which should have stopped them doing silly things, and therefore it was no longer, it was not appropriate and unnecessary. Indeed, uh, we were rather above that kind of thing in this country. Those poor little countries that had to write down all their own rules were somehow inferior to us. This is, of course, utter nonsense. Uh, and what has been demonstrated uh, in recent years uh, is that the capacity uh, to make sweeping constitutional change on a narrow parliamentary majority, indeed sometimes without one, um, uh, and the obsession uh, with sovereignty, not merely of Parliament, but of the House of Commons, and not merely of the House of Commons, but of the government which sustains a majority in the House of Commons, uh, means that we can do some pretty silly things unconstrained by constitutional convention, ethics or propriety. So um, there is an argument for doing something, something to make some laws harder to change, which is the principle of making some laws constitutional. Um, what I don't think we have the opportunity to do, however, and this was the view adopted by the Byrne Commission, is have the opportunity to have what you might call a Philadelphia moment, starting from scratch and writing everything down for the first time. Um, there isn't a consensus that we need that. And there are lots and lots of questions uh, which may or may not need answering, to which we don't have answers. And to put it at its simplest, if you were starting from scratch and writing the British Constitution on a blank piece of paper, would you start with a monarchy? It's not an obvious place to start. The Brown Commission made a different recommendation. It suggested that constitutional laws should indeed be harder to change. They should be able to be changed by Parliament, but not by Parliament uh, as it's constituted today, but instead by a majority of both the Commons and the Lords, or the replacement of the Lords, the Assembly of the Nations and Regions. And that would entrench certain constitutional principles, and those principles would be listed. Uh, uh, those pieces of constitutional statute, of which we have plenty, uh, would no longer be able to be amended on the whim of Mr Boris Johnson's government, which is what we have seen uh, in the last decade, but instead would require uh, the assent uh, of a second chamber which was differently constituted, constituted on a different electoral cycle uh, and on a different electoral basis. So this is a form of political constitutionalism, and it's consistent with the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. That's to say that Parliament as a whole uh, can choose to amend laws, but inside Parliament there's a much more challenging uh, and much more serious procedure that has to be followed before we amend constitutional laws. So this is, if, if you like, a written constitution light. Good. Well, thank you very much. Um, can I ask you now, because we're coming to the end of our time, um, to have give any any final remarks which you you have to make either about what you've said or or what the other has said but but can i um stick in two supplementary questions of my own one of which would be uh, england is 85% of the population as we 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 we've been hearing on a number of occasions um why is that a problem solved by confederalism when it isn't a problem solved by federalism if we're looking at um currency issues or foreign policy or the the areas which are undoubtedly the prerogative and interests of, of of the central organ of state why doesn't the english problem as it's called um uh figure just as largely in a confederation as it would in a, a federation and and secondly um do you think that our political culture will even uh accept the idea of a constitution light um, isn't this classically something that parties in opposition um, uh, commit themselves to, or think they're 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 ever, uh, admirable, congenial, whatever you like to call it? And then when they get into power, particularly if they get into power with a large majority, as may well be the case after the next general election, they decide that the rickety old constitution isn't so bad after all. Uh, could you 
make your concluding remarks, both of you, and, and perhaps uh, at least make a nod to the, the two points I've raised. Um, uh, Glyndur, I, I, we, we allowed you to start. We'll, we'll allow Jim to finish. Glyndur, start. Tell us what you think about um, those two propositions and any any final reflections that you have. Well, look, all unitary states, you know, such as the UK, face ongoing challenges in acknowledging the partial autonomy and diversity of their constituent nations, especially in sustaining the sense of belonging to the larger political body. And the uh, you know, the making of individuals' identities is complex and partly comprises their belief, social affiliations, and relationships within territorial groupings, and if people sense that these qualities are not treated by central bodies with equal dignity and respect, then they are likely to experience the circumstances of government as, as satisfactory. Now, those kinds of issues, those kinds of occurrences, for me, are better prevented, addressed through some form of written, codified understanding uh, between four nations particularly, uh, especially to help improve intergovernmental relationships across these aisles. And my view that confederates in places of the nations on a stronger footing uh, when making joint decisions on those areas discussed, such as defence, macroeconomics, uh, currency, as compared to federalism, where uh, potentially the equal status of today's nations with the English regions might confuse discussions and still keep uh, 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 the centre of gravity to weight heavily towards the largest, uh, the larger partner. Um, you know, indeed, look, the UK's withdrawal from one union, you know, the European Union, has intensified debates in Scotland and Wales about whether it should lead to the departure of their territories from another, the United Kingdom. And the situation in Northern Ireland, as Jim has already um, uh, uh, outlined, is, is more complex. But the inevitability of a border pole on Irish unity at some point in the future is progressively recognised. Uh, so it's imperative you know, that an informed debate on what kind of future would get the greatest possible traction across all elements of English, Scottish, Northern Irish and British society is, is progressed. The challenge of our time, and I feel this strongly, is not so much that exploration of constitutional futures is not being had, is that it is being progressed separately within each nation, rather than collectively as neighbours. Uh, you know, if we think of what's happening in Wales with the Commission, ongoing commission, the uh, debate in Scotland regarding independence referendums and uh, uh, and the circumstances in Northern Ireland uh, are possibly, you know, the, you know, the discussions, probably more informal discussions in England. Um, don't we need to come together and, uh, and, and, and look at this coherently? Uh, mm. By looking at it coherently, that'll force us to think uh, 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 of things on a more longer term basis on how we want to uh, shape a future that's uh, to benefit all our uh, for future for future generations. Uh, constitutional reform, you know, I think as we all probably can sign up to, is unfinished business in the UK, and will remain so until we uh, come together and talk about these uh, 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 bigger issues. Uh, for me, you know, a new yeah. social, economic, and security partnership directed by some limited but mature mature political legislature may well. Do the trick. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Jim, the last word for you. Well, of course, I, I very much agree with Glyndur that the UK has to look at itself as a whole and as a system uh, rather than as a series of bilateral deals uh, between the centre in Cardiff and the centre in Edinburgh and the centre in, in Ireland. Of course, it has always suited on occasion Cardiff or Belfast or Edinburgh to do a bilateral deal, uh, and when I worked for the government, I did some of them, um, and I, I apologise for that, but that's the way the world is. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we are um, we're about to move into, I think, to a time of constitutional opportunity for the first time in a long time. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, one is that there are some proposals on the table and the uh, potential next party of government has committed itself to them, and though I absolutely agree with you that there's many a slip twixt cup and lip, and I already see uh, distinguished members of the House of Lords saying uh, words to the effect of, oh yes, these are awfully good recommendations, but perhaps they're not an early priority for abolishing us. But um, uh, that's the uh, that too is the way of the world. Uh, however, 
Uh, the other thing that's going on, uh, which I think um, is highly relevant here, uh, uh, is what's happening in Scotland. Uh, as Glendur said, um, much of the UK's constitutional development over the last 20 or 30 years has been driven by the UK's response to the pressures for the demands of Scottish nationalism, uh, for the pressure of a referendum, the pressure for more powers and so on and so forth. Uh, Scottish nationalism is, I think, about to change in some way. I don't know exactly what way it will change. Uh, it's not merely uh, that there has been or there's about to be uh, a change of SNP leader. Um, that there is a, a realisation uh, that the project uh, which was launched by uh, that generation of SNP leaders in the 1990s, so the project of supporting devolution, the prospect of, uh, project of using it as a stepping stone to independence, has run into the sand. Uh, and a decade after uh, the referendum on Scottish independence, when the Scottish people said, no, thank you, um, a decade in which we've had some of the most uncongenial UK governments that, Scot that Scottish nationalists could have wished for, a decade in which we've had the upheaval and damage of Brexit, uh, the Scottish people are still in exactly the same place. So Scottish nationalism has to refocus itself and have a new project uh, for supporting Scotland's interests and Scotland's identity. I don't know what that project will be, uh, but there may be scope to go back to something which Glendur uh, referred to at the beginning, uh, for some form of conversation about what compromise uh, between those of us who uh, favour uh, sticking together in the UK to deliver the kind of central things that Glendur discussed, and those who want the maximum autonomy uh, for their historic nation uh, is could be possible, and the structures uh, in which it could be constructed have been laid out uh, by the opposition party, which is likely to form the next UK government. So suddenly, uh, we face a time of constitutional opportunity. Thank you very much indeed. It's the mission of the Federal Trust to, to encourage to debate on good governance and constitutional change. And I think we've certainly done that this afternoon. So thank you very much indeed, Jim and Glendora. Um, and I hope to see you both again soon, and perhaps you'll be contributing further to the work of the Federal Trust. Oh, Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye. Yeah.